Uh, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for coming up to the talk. And just a disclaimer, um, I couldn't finish the animation for the meta circular interpreter interpreting itself. So uh, we believe that for part two of the talk. And uh, I haven't slept for like 24 hours. So I'm just gonna speak of anything that come out of my mouth. So um, so this is the talk, uh, when a meta circular interpreter meets itself. And before I start, can I have a show of hands? Uh, how many non-programmers are in the room? Or just one? Or just, or just three? Okay, that's interesting. All right, so uh, so so uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Oliver Denvi. Unfortunately, he couldn't come here. Uh, excuse me, for exam period. Uh, for introducing me to the world of programming, programming language theory, and also thank you for uh, Todd Lewis for giving me all these uh, undergrad and grad texts in CS. All right, so we start off with the very simple question: is What is exactly programming? All right, and the Oxford Dictionary gives a very simple definition: uh, Programming is just the uh, process of uh, writing programs. And considering that all programs are written in some form of computer language, and of course, uh, programming, I mean programming language, and of course, uh, a program is just a bunch of text. So programming can be viewed as just the manipulations and compositions of text under a programming language. And uh, this is not a very interesting question, so uh, let's go here. So why do some people find programming language so intimidating? I mean, uh, I used to really get, uh, get I take kind of bad by it. So I started uh, programming when uh, I was uh, 11, and it took me four years to actually write my first Hello World program. So I, was, I managed to master HTML, CSS, was simple, static stuff. But when it comes to programming, it's weird. You know, this language, these things, and, it's right, and I just find it so intimidating. So what's, what's the problem? And it turned out, compared to human languages, programming languages are more like visitors. And um, so a lot of us have the preconceptions when we first started of um, to try to interpret it from a more human language point of view. And of course, that turned out not to work very well. So let's go. So uh, human languages and programming languages are intrinsically very different. We can see that uh, here is uh, an extract from the Linux kernel, where here is an uh, extract from several lines by uh, what's my favorite author, Rolf Waldo Emerson. And uh, if you look closely, you can see that there's like no resemblance here. But you can see here actually the word kernel is actually used on both sides, but of course they mean very different things. And uh, so, you know, it's very different, man. So how do we go about learning this language? And yet, however, on a more meta level, they are pretty much alike. So if you look at um, both give structures to strings, so you have strings, you have text, you just give structure to it. And of course, uh, can result in actions if passed to an interpreter. Okay, nice. And uh, easier to be adapted by the younger the human is. You know, younger you are, you learn programming much faster. And then of course, both evolve over time fit to fit the user's need, the, the human language and the programming language. So in this talk, we will get into these two um, uh, points here, which, all, uh, which, which introduce the notions of uh, interpreting which have to do with the ideas of uh, interpreters. All right, so uh, an interpreter is basically what they give life to a language, I would say. So these are what some of the interpreters for programming languages look like. Of course, some of them are also known as microprocessors, but microprocessors are really just interpreters for uh, these, uh, uh, these binary languages. Of, and then, of course, these are what interpreters for human language look like, just us. So we are the interpreters of the human language, and we have been doing this for millions of years now, and we are pretty good at it, which is very interesting. So now um, let's look at this scheme code here, which um, it just does a factorial uh, and um, does it recursively, structural recursions. So we expect to get the integer six from here, and then here is a JavaScript translations. So for those that are not familiar with schemes, but apparently I think everyone is familiar here. And, of, and then the Haskell translations are for fun. So you can see like Haskell just make things much more elegant here. And so the step one is uh, tokenizations. So based on some rules, separate character into groups. So we end up with a list of tokens as we, want, as we engage in the uh, process of interpreting. And then the second group will just be about parsing. So we give it structures. So that's when, based on some rules, pair of tokens are, are, are grouped together into smaller groups. And smaller groups are grouped together in the medium group until they get, become one giant group. And of course, um, if we go into this, uh, there's many ways to formalize the ideas of, um, of uh, this grouping of structures, which is also known as syntax, and one of them is known as BNF. 
So BNF is a very nice way that you can do this recursive definitions, like the definition of n here, that is a uh, the, the recursively defined uh, natural number. And then below is the, uh, the uh, BNF for some of these expressions in schemes. All right, so let's go up. So, so, basically, so, so from the above list of tokens, it generates an extract syntax tree, and this is the result of it. So you can see uh, that that's really what it all boils down afterwards and then uh, that's when you just three three traversal so uh, there's three steps and this is the last of the step where you begin with this tree all right so now you're interpreter you want to get interpret this program what do you do so first of all of course you start with here the program and then you go down go down here and then and then this is the definition part so you save this whole thing into the environments uh, and bind it to an name factorial so this whole thing just disappeared so the left side has been reduced to nothing now you go to the right side, applications, you go to factorial and replace it with the same factorial in your environments. So what happens is that you're gonna do this uh, uh, replacement here. So here, so now the tree is being transformed as you travel it. So now uh, you end up with a lot more things. And now here, so of course this, this is the function. So you put it into argument and then you replace every end with a tree. So now you end up with uh, the syntax trees and now you're gonna continue to reduce it. You realize that there's still factorial here. What's going on? So this is, the very nature of recursions where you just go on, okay, so you reduce this, then this thing once again replace with the factorial in your environments, and then you go to your trees keep growing. So until in the end, of course, uh, you replace everything with two, just like what you did just now, and then you see factorial here. Or, I mean, you replace this if statement first because uh, one, two doesn't equal to zero. And then you see factorial going on here. So once again, it does this, uh, the, the, this replacement. So in the end, you end up with this tree, and of course, factorial zero gives you back one, which is the base case as you define as we have defined previously in the if statement. So now we get one, and in the end, of course, then we just collect this whole thing to so one multiplied by one multiplied by two multiplied by three. So in the end, you get six, and that is how normally an interpreters uh, would go about interpreting the following text. So now, if you look at this, we realize that um, what we have written here is more like a text. It's strings. It's just um, not just symbols. So um, this is not a pipe. It is a famous painting by uh, Renan Magritte. And of course, this, this why isn't it a pipe? Because this is a representation of a pipe. And once again, if you look at here, this is not actually not a program. This is just a representation of a program. Just like a pipe is a representation of it, and it's not the actual thing. So from a more Eastern philosophical point of view, we can see that um, you know. As Lao Tzu once said, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. And the program that can be written, I would argue that is not the eternal program. Because the program that actually, is, that, that in, in the truest form is the program that is being executed, being computed, and not the program that is written. And we live in a world of representations. And so, rather interestingly, this reflects the very natures of um, reality itself. Okay, then uh, of course, this is the book of uh, the Tao programming. Highly recommend it. And uh, conceptually, tokenization, passing three servers, describe the basics of how a high-level language uh, interpreter does is in, does is interpreting. So, the low-level ones are often referred to as microprocessors. Uh, they're more straight, straightforward than that, just allocating memories, just pushing the stack, and things like that. But the hard part lies in designing and right, realizing realizing them in the physical realm. So, so if you take a step back, we see that. The very existence of these uh, microprocessors is the f is what that closes the gap between these conceptual worlds of programming and reality and getting things done in our computers. And uh, so, so of course. And now, if you even try to be more practical here, then in the real world, often um, we have to take into considerations of the performance. And so, the common practice is first to compile code or JIT or anything, and then feed them uh, to a lower level interpreter. And then, uh, of course, optimization uh, can be implemented much easier during the process of compiling because there is just a transformation from one type of string based uh, that th is described by a language to another type of string that is described by another language. And uh, compilation also reduces the size of code and uh, help with portabilities. So, okay, so if you look at uh, the architecture of uh, Google V8, uh, you have evolved a lot since 2000, uh, 2008, yeah, not 2018. <laughs> I made this slide uh, last night actually. Too busy with work, so um, so anyway, uh, so 
you, you, you start off with just code gen and then just get semi-optimized code. It's the beginnings of everything, obviously. And then of course, then you realize, that, okay, you actually want to do some optimizations for code that you have run for a lot. So that's when they introduced these. And then, uh, then later on, they got more different stuff. And so in today's, uh, so this is early 2017, is like they're trying to make things simpler, but end up just making things even more complex because of portabilities. So they have to, so, you know, all these uh, ways to integrate different components. And in the end, they end up just getting very complex. So, but uh, the reason one is just, uh, Initions to bycode, oh, sorry about this, is an alarm clock to remind me that there's a talk here. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, okay, so now Initions just go to bycode and then, and these are for a normal ones, so because sometimes optimization can actually end up slowing down the process. And uh, this is quite interesting. So uh, the first time that they, they did optimization, they used the ben benchmarking of the like the top 10 most visited JavaScript sites, which are like uh, Google Map and things like that. And they use really complicated JavaScript. So they try to optimize that and they does the benchmarking, it's really great. But then later on they realize that, oh, actually most sites, they don't use so complex JavaScript. So in the end, it turned out that for, in general for websites, uh, JavaScript loads slower because of this complex architecture. And so in the end, the best way is just that uh, we do the spy code and then later on, uh, if the code has been run a lot, then we, we, does, uh, we use the turbo fan and then we get more optimized code. So um, the source is available here and uh, I'm still in the midst of decon deconstructing it, so I couldn't really get too deep into it yet. And uh, so V8 is returning C++. And that brings a very interesting question, a very interesting notions of uh, the interpreter itself. So interpreters are actually just programs and just like compilers, they're all just programs. So and just like any programs, an interpreter can be written in, uh, I mean, it needs to be in a language and it can be written in any language. So, so the simplest and the most elegant interpreter, I would say, is a language where uh, it's one where it's returning the language itself and implement the very features using the existing feature uh, homomorphically. So, and these interpreters are known as meta circular interpreters, are uh, very interesting things, I would say. So now, um, of course, compared to interpreters like V8, these are just toys, really, because uh, there's not much optimization going on there. There's just, it's just something that's more for a conceptual uh, understanding of the language itself and what is so now here I will show you very briefly a uh, meta interpreter I wrote uh, for skin so um, if we go to oops go to here so oops what's going so on to enlarge the text all oh, right so if I so it's atom I can go into this scheme file and so, and so this is a meta circular interpreter that I wrote, and uh, of course this just interprets a subset of a scheme, because interpreting the whole thing turned out to be a lot more troublesome than I've expected. So anyway, uh, we start off a bit of test here. So these are just test cases, and then uh, we want to test the meta. Uh, we want to test the interpreter. All right, and then um, so. This is not a list of helper procedure, but actually it is. But of course, if you look at it here, you see that there it starts with this uh, this symbol here, and what it means is really that this whole thing is just uh, a symbol by itself, in the sense that uh, it's a representation of a defined procedure and not defined procedure itself. So of course, then you go down here, you see the uh, proper list at least of equals, to, so it's just recursive uh, definitions of this uh, this test a function that returns uh, boolean values to test if the properties is of length some v and then uh these properties of fixed length blah, blah blah so these are all just helper functions really like identities okay so this is not a list of predicates so here is where uh once again actually it is a list of predicates but that is what it described um so so these are a representation of it so that's why you start with this and so um you have each keyword so Keyword here, if you look at it, it's really just um, code time, if, con, else, let, all this stuff. So these are the keywords in my interpreters where uh, I will want to reserve for it, so I don't want the user to define something that overrides it. And the next is, uh, is integer, which of course we define meta circularly, so it's just integer. So it's integer, it's just integer, and um, it's Boolean, it's uh, once again invoking the same function Boolean. And of course, uh, just a little, uh, 
make a little dis distinctions here. So in t integers here, this is already defined in the current runtime if I'm going to run this. Meanwhile, this is a procedure, this is the name of what I'm going to define. All right, so once, as this, once again, this is also a Boolean, and then this is Boolean, string, string. So this is where the, the meta circular recursive um, definition begins. Okay, then it's variable, so uh, it's simple, and not its keyword. Okay, this is right, it's code. Okay, so these are just uh, fu predicates, just functions to check if something is a certain type. But of course, uh, we don't really have a type system here. So we, we are just doing some if statements here, and uh, it's lambda, so try proper list. And supply is begin. So these are all just checking stuff. So now this is not a list of accessors. Once again, this is a deep representation of a list of accessors. So the first one just access the integer. The second one just access the boolean. The third one just access strings. And then and once again, they are defined recursively by the identity identity function um, because you just need to get the identity. And then of course there's code where where you get the uh, the, the the one. The, the, the second one in the list, this is L, is, is start, the list starts with zero index. Anyway, so these are just accessors. So you want to get the if, the, the first if statement, then you then this give you the first part of the if. This give you a second part of the if. The blah blah. So these are all just stuff. And then after this, then of course this is not a list of procedure, and this is a list of procedures, and you just append them together so they all come together. And now, uh, now let's go all the way. So these are all just. Uh, different procedure once again uh, definitions. Okay, so this is where the interesting part uh, kicks in. So this is not an interpreter. Uh, this is a representation of interpreter. So now we begins by, of course, uh, you want to uh, evaluate list of uh, procedures. So is it outside environment? And then uh, if it's not, so what we are doing here is, um, so, what we okay um let okay so this is a left statement okay let's look at this code again I wrote this code two years ago so uh, I'm gonna look a little bit okay so okay this is kind of a mystery here I'm not sure what it does yet and uh, this is also a little bit strange um okay let's lo look down first okay look okay, at this is familiar guy I love this guy environment lookup so you go to environment and look up something for you and of course um you know the definition is quite funny so it takes x environment and then apply x back to environment and then of course now it's predefined procedure so we let predefined procedure to be if a list procedure this is not a list okay so this okay so this guy is defined up here right okay so okay great once again uh this remains a mystery. All right, and then environment extend. Okay, this, this makes a lot of sense. So this is where we want to extend the environment. So suppose we have environments where there's a variable A. Now we want environments where there's a variable B that equal to two. So this is how we are going to extend the environment. And there's many ways to actually um, define the environment. So here the environment is defined um, by a very high level functions where you just keep uh, overwriting and, and unwrapping it like uh, the way you I'm um, red like the skin of onion, and then uh, there's extend and these things here. Um, so the, the okay, so this just extend a list of stuff. Yeah, so that's why I put this symbol here and x. So this is just once again, uh, really nicely is defined in terms of this extend one here. So anyway, now uh, if you look down here, let rec. So this means uh, this guy have to be uh, recursively defined so that it can be self referencing that by itself. So it's just like let, and uh, so. Evaluate. So here is when the, when you evaluate uh, a function here. So this function is really long. Oh, I just realized the syntax highlight is not turned on. Oh, this is weird. Okay, so this. Is, okay, anyway, let's look into it. So condition is integer e. So we do integer zero. So uh, is boolean. Then we get boolean zero e. Is string. We get string e. So there is environment. So we get environment lookup. It's code, then we get just, these are just accessors that we have defined previously. And then of course time, then just, you just get a time. And, and once again, the time here is already defined in runtime. So this is something that once again is a meta circular definition. And actually the whole thing here is meta circular definition. So uh, evaluate environments and uh, if condition, once again, uh, so taking the uh, uh, Parameter the, the, the argument e, and after that it just uh, defines the visit, and then later on uh, it's just going to uh, just going to do this condition, and 
evaluate C based on uh, based on the environments and all these, and otherwise, once again, he's trying to go back to the head and uh, his tail. So, so this is um. All right. Hmm. Yes. So yeah, this is just evaluating. Uh, this is just checking if this is an environment and then we just run the following code. Otherwise, we go down here, it's lambda. So we check if the expression is lambda and then we, we just run the following code once again. Uh, uh, like lambda here is uh, the one in the runtime. So now we are just defining it meta security and apply here is just to applying things, applications, let, mm -hmm. and all this is, so So all this is just uh, basically checking if this is the let statement and then we just, uh, run through this code where it just is defined in terms of uh, the run the, the feature that has already been defined in the runtime and then you just go through it and uh, land the body then we just go through it and uh, so so in the end of course then if it couldn't find anything so it's not a begin it's not a uh, definition it's not a let it's not an application then we just print, a, print an error and then here is also the part where uh, I spent a lot of time debugging. This is the part that you initialize the environments, and apparently, uh, initializing environments can be quite cumbersome because uh, what we want to do later on is to apply the meta circuit interpreter into itself. In which case, what you are really doing is that you have a meta circuit interpreter that can interpret either a subset of the current language features or the language feature, everything inside itself. And if so, if you, de you define something that I'm not using. Uh, a certain syntax that is already part in this in the language itself and then you, you define here so later on when you interpret it uh, basically you have only defined a subset of the interpretation and so you run out uh, and you get error and it's super hard to debug here and so uh, and then of course you extend the environments and then you just evaluate so now uh, if you do petty so petty meta circular interpreters scheme so now this uh, this uh, runs the code here and then now if we do th uh, this is not a oh, what is no don't want this and uh, a list oh, okay this is not an interpreter all right so if you do this is not an interpreter then yes this is not an interpreter why because it is print out the representation of the interpreter which print out the symbols but then, if, but then what we can do, so what we can do is when um, we can evaluate this thing. So to make it an actual interpreter, we have to evaluate it. It's similar to when you have see apples uh, in front of you. To actually, to actually uh, conceptualize the apple, you have to evaluate these pixels that no, not pixels. These lights that have reflected into your eye, and then you interpret it with the the memory that you have that you associate with, with the abstract concept of an apple and that's really just how everyone lives their life just by interpreting things in front of them with abstract con concepts so in the end um, the, this is not interpreted until when you evalu evaluate it so uh, this is not an interpreter so if you evaluate it of course um, you, you want to bind this to something so now uh, when you so now this is an interpreter, so you just say interpreter. So you define interpreter as the evaluations of a representation of an interpreter. So of course, now um, I have uh, make a typo. So it's just more like this, and of course, uh, I forgot the uh, terminals uh, mic macro to go to the okay the end of the line. Great. So now it define interpreter as the evaluation of the symbols. And so now we can use this interpreter to um, to do some things like uh, let's say, oops, interpreter to do some things like just say one. So it's gonna give one because it's evaluating one. Very nice. What about doing this? Oh, okay, it's still gonna give it once because one is so. What happened? So th there's actually a little bit distinction here. So the first statement. So this statement here, we pass it a representation of one and it evaluate and give the representation of one. But the second statement here, one is evaluated in the current runtime. So actually, we are not passing one, the symbol one to it, but we are passing the value one to it. And so really fascinating. And of course now, uh, what can we do? Okay, let's just put itself into here. So what if you do this? So what if you do this? What's gonna happen? 
Okay, so um, I'm recognized input procedure. So um, apparently, uh, this interpreter doesn't know how to evaluate a procedure that's already been evaluated. So what you can do is, of course, you want to. So when the inter when the meta circular interpreter meets itself, you have to meet its representations. You just can't meet itself. Otherwise, um, unless you define it, but I think. Um, I mean, in this case, it's not working. So anyway, now you define I, I, I2, I know, I2 as an interpreter that evaluate the interpreter. So now, uh, OK, what's going on here? Inter so unbound variable interpreter. So interpreter is not defined. Why? Because this is not an interpreter. So this is not an interpreter. Yes, and then I works. And since this is not interpreter, so well, you don't have to have this uh, dot. And now I2 is an interpreter. Okay, it shows procedure. So I2 is an interpreter that is evaluating an interpreter and that's the result of this. So now if you do I2, um, we can do something simple here. So if we do I2, we just want to do some things like evaluate. Okay, let's put in the uh, this thing that we have defined previously here. So where was it? Okay, so let's, def let's put in factorial. Okay, factorial. Sure, factorial. So now, um, well, if we put fact factorial here, so of course we can use factorial just like the way we want to use it. Oh, okay, three, now six, okay. We can also define a uh, not a factorial, which is a representation of a factorial. So now we put in here, I equal four. So not a factorial is a representation of factorial. Now if we do, so now of course uh, we can just put in this thing in the interpreter, it's fine. So not a factorial. So, oh, oops, uh, what's going on? Okay, so now it doesn't understand defined. Okay, so this is the interpreters where I didn't define defined. So this is why uh, it shouldn't understand defined. So this is the interpreter where, uh, quite strangely, I'm not sure why I didn't define defined. This is weird. Okay. I think this is something, this is like uh, not the final version of the interpreter. Uh, and I don't know why I don't have the final versions. Mm, okay, so now, okay, now, but we can still do something fun. So we can still uh, use I2 to evaluate the not and interpreters. So now we want to define uh, I3 to be I2, which is the interpreter, which is the outcome of an interpreter evaluating an interpreter into an interpreter. So now, of course, it's not an interpreter, so it does not. A in okay, not a factorial. No, I don't like this guy. Uh, this is, uh, so not an interpreter. What? What's going on? This is not, this oh, this is not. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so this is not an interpreter. It's not an interpreter, but this is. It is. This is not an interpreter. Okay, so this is not an interpreter. Okay, I three. Okay, now arrow F. Okay, yeah, this is bad. So. Like I have said just now, uh, arrow f here is defined in terms of the existing runtime, but it's not defined in the interpreter. So now I put in this interpreter and it couldn't even re evaluate arrow f. So uh, I, I wanted to do a little bit experiment here to demonstrate that uh, if you have a lot of interpreter, interpreting, interpreter, interpreting, interpreters, to be the outcome of interpreter, interpreting, interpreters, then when you run these things and you ev evaluate the same program, what's going to happen here is just really like, uh, I mean, I, I was making an animation, right, but I couldn't finish the program of, to make the animation. So I couldn't even make the animation. Anyway, so uh, this animation is GIFT. So now you start here, you can see that the tree is travel show. It's just making a tree bigger because, um, well, the factorial is defined recursively. So if you have an interpreter and we, we evaluate it, you get a bigger tree, of course. And this tree is going to evaluate the interpreter, which is by itself a net tree. There is another tree tra traversal. We have a little, we have very interesting uh, recursive nature to it that is very structural. So it's a different recursive nature than, like, say, the factorial here, but it's a recursive recursiveness that is uh, defined in t that's, that exists more meta and that is, is very similar to when you have a lambda calculus and you have these y combinators where you put these two things together and it's trying to evaluate but anyway so um, well uh, yeah uh, this book so uh, just to just to show that this is a real book and I recommend everyone to get this this is like the book that I just opened up, up my mind and uh, so once again, uh, okay, uh, show you briefly a meta circuit interpreter that 
can interpret itself, but itself can't really interpret itself. So, and then thank you, and feel free to follow me on Twitter and drop me a message. And uh, or join me in the alpha testing of a cryptocurrency I'm working on. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, thank you for coming up. And uh, I still have three minutes, so it's a Q&A time. <laughs> Yeah, uh, aside from being a lot of fine bending fast, why did you do this exercise? <laughs> ah, I do this exercise because um, I feel like doing this exercise. <laughs> yes, um, and, um, and you know, it's just, um, I, I want to understand the language. I, I, I realized that uh, the language theory is actually very interesting and I'm thinking I'm more of an art person, but you know, I realize that these things actually there's an art approach, the art more of an art approach to me. And so this is for uh, the fun of the race. It's like a Haskell code, just write it for fun. <laughs> yeah, a lot of mind bending fun. <laughs> Any more questions? The additional overhead in terms of multiple levels of interpretation. What type? Yes, so um so apparently um I tried it with like four interpreters. So the first the first, second, third one is running alright, but the, when the fourth one kicked in, that's when like you have to take two, two to three minutes. It, 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 and of course uh, I discussed with my professors and so apparently uh it's not just exponential exponential, is uh the, the way the time increases is like much more than exponential, um, and yeah, very interesting. So these things, yeah. Yeah, just to share a fact, the GCC compiler is written in GCC, uh, so it's it's the same concept, nice. except that it is nested so many times now, uh, and it hasn't gotten slower because of optimization. Oh really? That's yes. interesting. What does it do? What, what optimization? Or was it? Is it? Well, uh, some black magic to me, but like. Ah, <laughs> nice. Yeah, I will look into that definitely. Now that I have free time. Yes, GCC. What about the Apple GCC though? Yeah, it's written in GCC. No, what about Apple's implementation? Uh, oh. the C. I can't Pen. remember the. Pen. Yeah, the uh, I don't know. Oh, okay. I know about the GCC. Yeah, I will look into that. Yeah, thanks. More questions for Archie? Okay, so thank you, Archie. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming to the talk.